the Carl B. Phillips Show. Hosted by me, Carl B. Phillips, Uncle Carl. The Carl B. Phillips Show. Get ready for another great conversation on the Carl B. Phillips Show. Welcome to the Carl B. Phillips Show. I am Carl B. Phillips, Uncle Carl. Today's guest is my big brother. He is a Detroit, Michigan native songwriter, singer, choir director, radio station owner, radio show host, and an Emmy Award winner. Please welcome my brother, my friend, Dr. E. LaQuint Weaver. What's up, bro? Hey, what's going on? The one and only Carl B. Phillips. What's going on, man? How you doing? I'm doing well, all as well. We've known each other a long time. Very long time. Very long time, long time. Long. yes. And, mm-hmm. and we, we, we were just talking about how at our age, God is still allowing us to still do things. So I'm, exactly, I'm, exactly. I'm honored to be able to have you as a part of this show and being able to speak with you. As I told you, I'm going to ask some random questions. So the okay. first random question if space travel was available to everybody, would you go on a space trip? Uh-uh. <laughs> I, I'm gonna stay here. I'm gonna stay right here. I, I know this. I, I, me and too far going up in the air is too much for me. And I, mm-mm, mm-mm. I don't like. I didn't even watch Lost in Space. So, you know. <laughs> only, only travel you're gonna do is when God give you two wings. <laughs> you have to, fly, to go that far up now i'm a little nervous when we own delta or uh, whatever america i'm a little nervous there but no time about you going into space no i don't think so i'm gonna leave that to the astronaut that's not my gift <laughs> before we started the interview you were talking about your daughter la quinta yes i think la quinta added a new dimension to your life what was it like raising La Quinta and watching her mature into a grown woman? Um, it was very exciting. And uh, it was a gift that I knew that I, uh, from God, that I knew that I had to, um, I had to set an example. Mm-hmm. And now I was watching her grow up. Um, of course, she did a little kids things, you know, uh, don't do that, La Quinta. But she's always brought me great, great um, grades in school. She's always been mannerable. I've always taught her uh, to treat others as you want to be treated and always to respect your elders. So that was the way I was raised. So when I put that before her and she caught hold to that and she started doing that, that was an honor for me. I had so many people to tell me that how mannerable she was. And then she graduated, Carl. Um, um, from high school and she went on to go to college and then she got in college and uh she um things happened and but right before she walked across the stage she made the announcement you're going to be a granddad i'm like oh no so uh but i watched her during that time even her now fiance which is the baby's dad mm-hmm. um they um they she had the baby carl and she um the baby came very early uh i think she was 27 weeks uh uh, you know um too early you know Mm -hmm. but uh she only weighed a pound and we prayed we prayed and we prayed and i watched carl my daughter stay up at beaumont hospital every day around Mm -hmm. the clock um, she and then I began to ask her because we were so close to her commencement uh, 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 happening at from Oakland. And I says, well, are you graduating? And that's what I really got upset about, because I was like, oh, my God, this girl ain't going to graduate. And I, we done went through all of this all these four years. And she was surprising me, Carl. I had no <laughs> idea that's, that's the way she was doing it. So what she did was she kept it a secret. And so I asked her, do we need to call the dean? We're getting close. I said, well, I said, LaQuinta, don't worry about it. I said, why don't you just wait? You just had the baby and uh, you can walk across the stage in May. She was persistent. She wanted to walk in December. She had to, it was something about graduating early for her. It meant a lot. And Mm -hmm. so she kept on and I asked the week, it got closer. And I says, do you need me to call the dean? And she never, she, she blew me off with some, some stuff. So I, I said, well, don't worry about it, you know, 
And so she and her uh, now fiance came to the house and said, hey, we got some tickets to go to a movie. A brand new movie is going to be blah, 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 blah. So I says, uh, I don't, I said, okay, at first I said, I didn't want to go to the movies. Then they said, no, it's a premiere. It's going to happen. And so I said, okay. So finally they came over here um, and they gave me some, some tickets in an, in an envelope. And I took the tickets and I put them on my, my stereo speakers. And I proceeded to walk on back into the back room to do something that I was doing. Mm -hmm. And um, they came back and said, you're not going to get the tickets. They get the tickets to see what it was. I said, well, it's a movie. You said, you guys said that we were going to a movie. It's a premiere. So I don't know what the premiere is, you know. So they said, look at the tickets. And Carla opened the ticket up. They were so adamant about me opening this envelope. So I opened the tickets up and it was saying that the Oakland University facility proudly invites you to the blah, blah, blah commencement of. And I looked at her. I said, you graduating. She says, yes, daddy, on Friday. I just flipped out, Carl. Oh, wow. I flipped out completely out so yes i am very happy long story short i'm happy she's walked across the stage she um she's now a, a school teacher she's been teaching school for two years now and she and, and now she's a homeowner you know she surprised me with that so she's got her own home and then on the 30th of september she was asked to become uh mr austin hunter's wife and mm -hmm. she accepted so I got a wedding. I got to get ready for, you know. To... Wait, you got a wedding to pay for. <laughs> oh, oh, have I though? Yes, sir. Yes, I got a wedding to pay for. I wonder why they make us pay for the wedding. Why we just can't go half and half, you know? Why the men, why we have to pay for the daughters? It happens. It is. So, yes, yeah, so I'm doing my best now preparing for it. Uh, she says she's not going to do it until a year and a half. So she's giving me a year and a half. So I've had some things to the side, but, um, I know I've got to do a, a little bit more because this gown you, is. You, you may have to do a couple good. concerts, a couple musicals, a couple barbecue chicken sales. Yep, yeah, <laughs> yep. Sell some candy bars. I got popcorn. I got candy. Popcorn. What's up? I got everything. Just come on, you know. Yeah. So I, I'm going to do that. She's she's been a very good girl to me. So and she's been a blessing for me. So I'm happy. Uh, and now I'm a granddad. So uh, that's a whole new arena. Something I've never had to ex experience. So and they cool. always said the grandparents always um, let the grandkids get away with murder. You know, that's going to lead to my next question. Being a granddad, how has having a granddaughter changed your perspective on life? Oh, a lot. Um, very much so. Um, my perspective on life is, is it's always been serious uh, for me, but mm -hmm. it's even been even more serious now. Um, and, you know, generations change and what have you. And it's very important now that me as the grandfather that I that she sees me walking in a in a perspective way such as LaQuinta saw, so that she can say, well, I understand this is where mama got this from, how to respect people, what I need to do. So I want my granddaughter to to be raised the same way I raised LaQuinta um in um and, and knowing how to love people and knowing how to treat people. Mm -hmm. So it's changed me a whole lot. Um, now, um, I don't know. It's, it's a hard thing to say. Being a grandparent, it, it's a, it's a feeling, Carl. It's, it's exciting. It's, um, uh, it's just, it's joyful. It's mm -hmm. loving, um, to see that your child has a child now. And your child is, 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 is you're in a different position. So now she's looking at you as big papa now, you know, and what have you. So yeah, it, it, it it's changed me a whole great deal, but I love every moment of it. I do. <laughs> I do. You know, as I was um, doing research for this interview, I've read about how you were raised in a God fearing home surrounded yeah. by gospel music. At what age did you develop your personal love for God and a personal connection with gospel music. Wow. I, my commitment to God to give him my life was at the age of 10. Hmm. My musical ability started, which I didn't think I knew, I didn't even know what I was doing, Carl. I'm just doing it because I saw it, you know. Uh, it was because it was around the house. My brother played, 
my mother taught my brother, my mother taught my sister Ruby, and uh, she was going to teach me, but um, I want to sit down and just play. You know, I didn't want to be, no, you know, I don't want to be going through A, B, C, D, uh, mm -mm, mm -mm, not me. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> learning your notes. And my mother, she taught a numerous of a lot of uh, musicians down in Birmingham, Alabama, before we moved here, mm -hmm. uh, how to play. And uh, I didn't want to do that. You know, I want to just get out and sit down and play. And so she popped me. So I says, oh, no, no, we, we're going to change this. I'll stand up and I'll sing and you three play for me. And so after that, that worked. Uh, and she discovered me singing at the age of five. And then my love for it just grew more and more and more and more and more for it, you know? So, and then she started to uh, act, you know, she trained me to start directing the choir. And uh, from there, it, it just started, but giving my life to the Lord, I never will forget it. It was 10 years old. And uh, Reverend uh, C.L. Moore used to be the pastor of New Whitestone Baptist Church here in Detroit. Uh, he had a church called New St. Joseph Baptist Church, and that's where we were attending when we moved here. And uh, he baptized me. Wow. You speak very highly of your mother being a, a musician, an organist. Uh, she also was a part of the legendary Dorothy Love Colts. Yes. How did being around your mother, your, your family, uh, Dorothy Love Coates, how did those times help develop the Dr. Eloquent Weaver sound? I I think it helped to develop because um I heard it. I just I kept, you know, it was it was something that was in the house, you know, mothers playing. There were times on Dorothy. Uh, I would remember them. They would come over. There was one particular point in time on Dorothy came to be with us for the month or so. And she had a daughter named Cassandra. She had polio. And uh, they were um, they would get around the piano and start singing, you know, like, Lord, you've been good to me was invented at the house, at my mom's house. And I, Dorothy was going through something. And when she wrote that song out and um, Carlton Reese was playing for them and Herbert Picard was playing for them. Um, they had a you know, so you, you know, these people were playing and they were singing and it caught my attention and it, I would sit, my mom said, I would just sit and out of all the other things she would be saying, LaQuint, get out of this, stop doing this, LaQuint, doing this. But when it came time for them to start singing, I would sit and just become quiet and listen and, and, and learn. So she taught me even the, um, how to even sing a fast song. My mom was so instrumental to me, you know. Uh, my breathing technique. Um, don't sing ahead of a, in a fast song. She would tell me, "Why are you trying to fight with the background? Finish your sentence. Finish your sentence on what you're saying. You know, if you're saying Jesus is a healer and he healed whomever you're going to say he healed, finish the sentence. Just don't say Jesus is a healer and he and then that's it. You know, no, 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 no." Finish your sentence. So mm -hmm. she was very driving force with that, you know, and taking your time, not starting at the top of the mountain, because if you start at the top of the mountain singing, you don't have anywhere to go. So right. pace yourself, you know, have somewhere to go and then receive the message that you got and, and, and put it inside of you. Don't try to sing it like someone else. Sing it like you would sing it. So that's what the mom was very, that's with all of us, you know, myself, Ruby, and my brother Nelson, uh, my sister Dee Dee, she didn't, she didn't want to sing, but she was just there. But we were the three that she really was on. And basically she really did was on with me because of a, a young age and she knew that I had a passion for it and I loved it. You talked earlier about how you started singing and directing around five years old. Mm-hmm. Within the city of Detroit, you've worked with some legendary churches, Palestine Missionary Baptist Church, Obedient Baptist Church, plus having your own group, the Hallelujah Singers. Talk about the joy being a choir director brings you. It brings me a lot of joy. Uh, I like the creativity of it. I like to hear, um, I like to teach it. I like to teach the soprano, the alto, the tenors. Uh, if there's some bass, I like to teach them. and. Um, the creativity of it coming together to hearing, oh, God gave me this to give to these people. And these people are singing what God has given me, but I'm the teacher, 
you know, I'm mm -hmm. no longer the student. So I, I, you know, where I used to have to sit up under and listen to mom and everybody else that I set up under teaching, this time I get to do it. And so with the help of, you know, we had a, we had a founder that taught us at a young age, and I'm sure we'll get to him in a little bit, but anyway, he, he was, and that was another thing that I watched. I was watching um, Donald teach us. Right. It, the, 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 the choral, you know, how we just, it was just balanced, you know, how, how quick he could teach a song, you know, how he could make it enjoyable for us, you know, and what have you. Now, you know, I'm, you know, some of the songs we probably didn't like, but we didn't have a choice. We had to sing them. But those that we did, not about 10, you know, 99.9, .9, everything that he brought us, we really, really enjoyed it. So um, those things like that and, and, and experiencing with the church choir and the community choir and the group, those are two different things, you know, because with the church choir, you had to prepare and make sure that your songs that you sing at 11 o'clock service, are, there's a difference between those two songs that you teach. Um, everything song that come out, which I was taught, it's not an 11 o'clock service in that time. I don't, I still use that with me. Um, and uh, not saying that the song, uh, that's a more upbeat, a more contemporary thing, it just didn't reach for Sunday morning. Sunday morning, we were trying to reach those centers or, or those people that were burdened or people contemplating on having doing bad things to their body or anything you know we were trying to deliver them from that and some of the upbeat songs didn't speak about the deliverance as strong as those other songs for 11 o'clock so um i had to learn all of that and and once i got it i even had to learn that sometimes i rehearsed the choir one particular new hot song that's out mm -hmm. but if pastor preaches something about him working it out. Uh, though we have spent weeks learning this brand new song to present it on Sunday morning, it wasn't the time to do that song because right. the spirit was so high. I had to stay in the in the flow and in the atmosphere of what pastor's text was and, and his sermon was. So I better reach back and get that song that we sing that represent that sermon and it helped. And um, I, I, it was a learning it was a learning thing for me um and so that's with the church choir with the group oh my god the group was it was challenging because i didn't want to be like anybody else and my directors that i um uh, were mentors to me mm. were uh dr lucille lemon um the late dr lucille lemon uh the late mr Win winston poe and Brother Allen, I think Allen's last name is Rogers from the Charles Fall Singers. Those were my favorite directors. Had mm -hmm. a lot of energy, high energy. Um, and uh, they just did their thing, you know. And I was like, oh, okay. So that's that's the LaQuint Weaver. You know, that's that's me as far as the directing is concerned. You, I'd like you, to put it together and see it done. You, you brought up some, some names that were a part of... Um almost a golden era of gospel music. You okay. talk about Dr. Lucille Lemons. Uh, you yes. talk about Charles Fold singers. You talk about Herbert Picard. Yes. For a young person that was growing up to have access to those type of singers, to those type of choir directors, what was that like for you? Exciting. Oh, it's very exciting. Um, they didn't have a band. Uh, musicians wise they didn't have a band they as my mother said they had to make the piano and the organ talk you know it had to talk to you you know um they didn't need they didn't they didn't have drums and bass and stuff that we had they had to stand around the microphone one mic you know everybody said we got to have their own mic no, no 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 they had to stand around that one mic form a, a semi-c circle and stand behind that one mic and sing and clap their hands and maybe they got a tambourine maybe they and somebody beat the tambourine to keep the beat you know going and and you could see the piano just playing you know the piano player just into and hitting every note and going up in the fine keys and you know it was like enjoyable it 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 gave you a good feeling a good rush you know uh, it filled you up you know if you was depressed gospel music still does that it will fill you up so being around those type of people and watching man i was excited you know that's i think that's what really pulled me in oh my god this is what i want to do you know to, to to hear and see all this great gospel music being sung and then to see the people to see them sing to the people 
so good and the spirit so high that it reached those people that they began to shout and praise the Lord. That I I loved it, Carl. I loved it. You and I met, of course, being a part of Donald Vale's voice, Reverend Donald Vale's voices of deliverance. That's right. You were like one of the founding members of the Voices of Deliverance. Well, founding member, does that make you feel old? <laughs> uh, you're also I, I, I the Phillips. <laughs> you're also a feature vocalist on the debut project of the Voices of Deliverance. You talk yeah. a little bit about working with Reverend Vale, Reverend Donald Vale. Just go a little bit more into that. You know, Donald. Okay. Donald was, I remember, you know, you did everything. You did pop, you did gospel, you did anthems, you did hymns. Talk about the relationship that you had with Donald Vales. Donald was my spiritual musical daddy. Um, Donald reprimanded me. Donald taught me. Donald lectured me. <laughs> Donald, I... Carl, I often wonder, I don't know if you often wonder, how does one man take 350 young people and control us in school, getting college degrees, preparing us for college? It wasn't just music this man had on us. This man had a Fatherly, a fatherly image on us. Because you know, Carl, many of us in the choir came from broken homes. There mm -hmm. were a lot of single parents that were mothers that were raising our brothers and sisters that we stood next to, you know, and what have you. And he taught us how to love. And so, and, and of course the music was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And we, we had a certain image that we had to uphold. We couldn't, even in choir rehearsal, we couldn't sit with our legs crossed and and kind of, you know, kind of cool and giving it to you like this or, 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 you know, oh, no, 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 no. You had to sit up in Donald Vale's, you know, choir. And, and if you're going to cross your leg, you had to cross it at the ankle. Everybody, you know, if not, Elder Fonsville had that cane and he was what? Going to pop you at your ankle to get, get you, get you together, put you back through. So Donald did a lot of things for me, um, taught me. Um, I, I will tell you, Carl, I hated both of the songs he gave me. Mm -hmm. I had three songs I recorded that night. I did, I did Real, What a Wonderful Savior I Found, and Forgive Me, Lord. I love Forgive Me, Lord. It was the very first song he gave me when I came. I fell in love. I was like, and he was already known. Um, number one, I'm excited. The Lord blessed me to sing with up under this great man of God musically in Detroit, Donald Vales, and I'm singing a song that he's given me to sing, and I love Forgive Me, Lord. And then he came back and he started teaching other songs, getting us prepared for the for the album at that time. What a wonderful Savior I found. And when he gave me Real, I thought the song was for Danny Wallace. I really did. And it was because Danny said, Donald had, you know how Donald teaches and he leads the song and he plays in it. And, and I'm sitting behind Danny and Danny's sitting in front of me. And I thought he said, sing it, Danny. And everybody did. We said, sing, Danny. And you know, he, he takes his glasses and look down up over him and say, I want to talk to Danny. I'm talking to you. And so, uh, and, and I jumped into the song to sing it. So I was kind of familiar with the words because my mom and them sung that kind of stuff. So um, so I just had to get the arrangement. So and then I sung it. And it was a beautiful arrangement. Um, Shirley Berkeley wrote it. We, we, we went to um workshop and I think it's 70, whenever it was at, in Washington. And her choir sung it because uh, that's where we were at. And I remembered it. And so he gave it. I'm like, mm. then we went through, forgive me, Lord. I'm like, okay, I know that's going to make it. And then he gave us what a wonderful savior I found. I despise that song. I just didn't like it. I just didn't think that it was me to sing with the trio. And of course, I'm used to trio singing because I'm hearing my mama. It was the kind of song. It was the caravan song. The caravan song made What a Wonderful Savior I Found. But I just didn't want to sing the song. I just didn't like it. So I made a bet with Lavelle Nero and with Chris Richardson and also with Edmund, Edwin Brown. Because, <laughs> you know, we were four. We hung together. 
And I told them, I said, I'm going to mess this song up. They said, I bet you won't. I said, I'm going to mess this song up. If I mess this song up, then I won't have to sing it. He'll give it to somebody else. I think he must have, I don't know what he had, some type of spirit. And he called for us to sing the song. And me, William, got up to the piano, and I purposely messed up the alto note. And before all of you all, he sit there and said to me, I know you hear this note. I said, oh, Don, I said, I don't hear this note. And I said, this, I, I just, can't. I was making an excuse. He said, you do hear this note. And he stopped beating the alto note. No, 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 you hear that note. He said, are you going to be dumb like this all your life? Whoa. Whoa. And you know, you know how, you know how we used to sit in choir rehearsal with that semi C. I was like, really? He's embarrassed. And everybody was like, yeah. And Jackson said, oh. <laughs> and to this day god rest his soul if donald was if we get to heaven and donald played what a wonderful savior i found i'm coming in with him and william rips because i will not be dumb all my life i'm for real so yeah i mean i've had my experiences with him he didn't play with me you know um and he told me before he passed the reason why he did that because he knew that not only would i do what i'm doing with him that I would be doing what I'm doing now. So real story, um, when I first came to the Voices rehearsals, mm -hmm. Donald called me up to be a part of a trio. I don't do trios. I, you know, I'm a choir director, I'm a tenor. Afterwards, he said, thank you. And I never saw anything else with the choir like that. <laughs> I was just a choir director because you know I I didn't know the song and like I said I'm I'm not a trio person uh, mm -hmm. trying to hold my, like doing this praise team thing trying to hold my note mm -mm. right that ain't me but see that's that's the result brother I wanted to get for what a wonderful savior I found that was the result I was looking for for him uh, to say McCoy. thank you go take a seat thank you go sit out go have a seat no it didn't work like that he says no. No, are you going to be dumb like this all your life? Yeah. You hear this though. And, and and I did. And I, I did, Carl. I just didn't. And I thank God for Jesus is real. <laughs> I thank God for what a wonderful Savior I found. Because I didn't like real. Because I felt like every song that he had given to me. And I was young. I was 17 years old. I think, you know, I'm saying... All these songs he give me, something wrong with me. I woke up soon one morning. My pillow was wet with tears. I'm crying. <laughs> What's going with him now? Then when we did What a Wonderful Savior, I, it says, when I'm, oh, when I'm in need, he's near. Something wrong with me again. I got to need something. <laughs> then when he said, forgive me, Lord. He, I said, my, my, I loved it. But I mean, my life was filled with sin. I was so uncleansed with that. Okay, everything had... um. Something wrong with me. What's wrong with me? Why can't I come to the microphone and say, when Jesus did such and such and such, and he did such and such and such, and what a great change it has been. No. And this man, this man of God knew what was best musically for LaQuint Weaver outside of my mom. And he did tell my mama, I made him sing it. My mama said, good, he should have sung it. She said, did you hit him? He said, I wanted to. She said, well, you should have knocked him down in the floor because she said it had been me. I would have knocked him down in the floor. She said, I wouldn't have been hitting the piano talking about, are you dumb all your life? I would have knocked him on that floor and he'd have got back on up and he'd have sung the song. And that's the truth. She had, she would do that. She, she did it to my brother. She's hitting with a bam. She, she said, mom, I'm tired of it. Can you make up your mind? You want to sing an E flat? You want to sing in C? What, make up your mind. She said, oh, what? She said, whatever I said, sing it. Play it. And he did the plan. He had a lot on his head, but he played it. So, yeah. So, I, I appreciate it. If you were running for an official office, president, mayor, whatever, what would your campaign slogan be? Oh, Carl. <laughs> I'll tell you what it would be now. It would be because people don't do that. This is my slogan and I use it all the time. It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Wow. That's my slogan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, I yeah. Think that's it's nice to be important, important, but it's more important to be nice, you know, because you need to be nice to the people. You know, mm -hmm. if you're going to run something, you just can't talk to people any kind of way or just, or just 
you know, like you so much and they're not that. And because you need their vote, you wouldn't be. So what's wrong with you being nice? You know, you get some people, you got some people that's in some high positions that are not so nice. Let's be real. We have some people in gospel music that need to apply that. I wasn't going to say that. I'm letting you say that. So you said it. So yeah, but so I'm going to go on with you. And, uh, yes, sir. I agree. They are. Yeah. Let's go back some to people. the Hallelujah Singers again. Okay. Uh, yourself, you're a part of the Emmy Award winning documentary, Let's Have Some Church Detroit Style. Tell the story behind the documentary and how your choir was selected to be a part of the documentary. Okay. I um I got the call from Mr. Sachs and Mr. Sachs says, hey, um, I want to do something um uh, with the choir since Detroit is going through bad times with the bankruptcy and seeing how a church choir or choir can survive through in these bad times. So I said, okay. So I says, well, Mr. Sachs, I said, I'd like to do a video, I say, and uh for my brand new single. And it's called Running. I say, and uh I'm working on a solo project called In My Golden Years. He says, okay, well, well, we'll we'll blend that in together. And so, yes, he did the video. Yes, he did the movie. The, the, but I thought it was just gonna be like for a month or two. Mm -hmm. Oh, this thing extended to four years. Oh wow. He kept taping and taping and taping. And so I didn't know. So finally we got awarded to go to Birmingham, Alabama for the Rhythm of Gospel Awards. We were nominated that year in nine categories. And um, he, when I knew anything, we were getting on the bus and he was following us <laughs> to this tripod and everything and his his whole complete cast. Well, my manager, Bessie, she knew that he was coming, but I didn't know. And so I was like, what this man following us again for? I said, Bessie, she said, he's got to finish up. We've got to. I said, well, what? I mean, it's a thesis. How long is this going? I mean, it's just a little something we should have been through with that. And then we, when we got and stopped off in Huntsville and got a bite to eat, the whole crew just jumped on the bus with us. Now, you know, we ain't we ain't got to the hotel yet. So we done overnight sleeping. We look a mess and they film. So when I, I just took the pillow, I had a uh, blanket that just covered myself. So I go back to sleep like they couldn't see because I didn't want to be on film that way. And so he filmed us, he filmed us and everything. Long story short, the film was finished. And then he says to me, I need you to meet me in Chicago. So mm -hmm. they were filming Empire, I think, during that time. And he asked me, he says, I need you to come quickly. And so he flew me into Chicago. And so we went to the place where they were filming, um, uh, cutting up, I mean, uh, editing for, uh, for uh, Empire. And uh, I started seeing us on the big screen. And I started seeing everything that he had done, did, how he put things together. And I'm like, wow. He says, well, we've been asked to be in the, um, for the Freak Film Festival. Uh, so he would say, I'm entering this film into the Freak Film Festival. I didn't know what that was, but I just knew it was at the DIA. So he says, well, let's go. We're going to do that. So we went. And the film for the weekend end up being so good according to the judges that it ended up in on the main stage wow. uh, to be featured on that Sunday. And so while there were other films that were there, but they were in different uh, auditoriums that, you know, you'd have the small auditoriums in DI, you know how they are. And mm -hmm. so I, I'm still lost because it's not musically, you know, but I'm listening to what's happening. And so they said, well, this is where you all are going to be. I said, this is the big stage. You know, when I went for a Thursday, I said, this is the big stage. So Mr. Mr. Uh, Sex says, LaQuin, he says, um, this film is is so far getting rave reviews. We're going to know if we're the number one film for um, after this is done, after the whole weekend, they're seeing different films. So Sunday we go, and it was jam-packed. Hmm. And I'm like, okay, so this the film comes on, Carl, and I'm I got emotional. You know, I'm like, God, I, I didn't ask for this. Wow. You know, I'm you know, I didn't know, you know. And so Dr. Betty Hall, my godmother, God rest her soul, she just grabbed my leg. She said, It's a blessing in this. And 
you just be still and just follow his lead. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, ma'am. And so we won the Free Film Festival overall. He won. Wow. So one Saturday, I was going to rehearsal. He says, um, I just want to tell you I'm getting ready to go um, to um, awards show. He says, nothing big. This is nothing big and what have you, you know. So he was keeping me calm. And um, when I got home from rehearsal, I I left the phone off and I turned the phone on. When the phone came on, all of my messages were popping up. They were popping up real randomly. Mm -hmm. So I happened to look at his and I could see Carl, you know, how you see just a, a picture, but you can see the whole picture. You had to open it up. So I saw this picture and I saw his head and I saw his wife's head and I saw them. They were at this big, beautiful, elaborate place. And she said, he says to me, God has blessed me to meet you. This is what God has done for us. Congratulations. You have won an Emmy. And I'm with the phone and I'm screaming. Wow. Wow. And I forgot who was at my home with me because everybody didn't go home. I think we got some chicken and we ate in my apartment. And the group starts saying, whoever is, what's wrong? I said, we don't want to eat me. They said, who want to end me? I said, we didn't know. And so they looked. And so I called Mr. Sachs. And um, luckily, he was still woke. And he was celebrating as well. And it that was it. I didn't look for the Emmy. We didn't look. We were trying to do a video for running. Not an Emmy, a film, you know. We No, that was not in the cards. We didn't strive for that or anything. It was him. So I hats off to you. Andrew Sachs. I will never forget you for this. Awesome story. We have to talk about your new single. Okay. Your new single is called His Job. Love it. Thank but you. The new single is not featuring the Hallelujah Singers. It's featuring biblical people. So That's let's terrific. talk about what's going on here with biblical well, people versus the Hallelujah Singers. Biblical people uh, is a group that I had down in Birmingham, Alabama. And they were feature, featured on one of the Hallelujah Singers recordings. And it was called uh, New Level. It was on the Sound of Gospel label. And um, my Aunt Cleo from the Cleveland Singers and Dorothy Love Coates is sung on there. And, and uh, Biblical People, my my baby's mom, Connie uh, Travis, she sung, Walker Travis, she sung on it. Her, my daughter's godmother, uh, from Detroit, she was a part of Biblical People, uh, Katisha uh, Walker um, uh, Stovall, she sung on it, and uh, and we had different people. So um, I went through a transition, um, Carl, um, and some things the Lord was telling me to do, and I was disobedient. And so long story short, this is something that he wanted me to do to continue on. Health-wise, it was, I was challenging me, and I was doing some things, and uh, my daughter said to me, dad, the doctor says, you got to chill out. You stressed out, you know, and you know how it is when you take something to heart, yeah. um, it, it takes to heart. And sometimes I wasn't getting the best of what I thought I should have been getting. And so I was going to just give up completely and retire. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I couldn't, I thought the first time when I did, I would call upon the Lord. I kept saying, I couldn't hear from God. And then he allowed me to do, I will call upon the Lord. But then I got back into it and it just didn't work. You know, it it, it was something still missing. And so um, we weren't, even Hallelujah Singers, we weren't there. We weren't there. Hmm. Not at all. And uh, I knew then I need to have to, I had to walk away to hear from him. So in the meantime, LaQuinta says, I talked with the doctor and if you don't straighten this up you're on your way to dialysis wow you know so i have chronic renal failure in the third stage um i've been had it carl oh maybe over 25 years but i've mm -hmm. been able to you know balance it and uh also i, I was given the wrong medication and it had a side effect to it it's called lisilopril and uh 
Lucilopril is not good for African Americans. Mm. And it took an effect on me in a different way. I looked for the side effect to come one way and it was coming another way. And I was hiding things. I was falling and um and, and I would play it off like I fail, but honestly, I hadn't I didn't fall. I, I just didn't have control of my body. It was mm. it was working with me different. And then it was messing with my kidneys, which threw me up to 3.5. And so um and then I'm worrying, is this going to happen? Are they going to do this? Are we going to do this? Are we going to do, you know, it's just all of that just came, you know? And so uh, I had to take a break. So my daughter said, I'll tell you what, this is not the end of this. Um, not the end of this. If you take the break, you keep going, daddy, go back and work on your, your solo project. You never did finish in my golden years. You just did running. She said, if you do this, me and DJ, my godson, We've come to the conclusion, we'll finance it. We'll be the executive producers. I says, okay. And so I went to the group and I took a leave of absence. Um, and uh, I came in and she says, I have one other thing, a favor of you. I said, what is that? She said, could you do my favorite song over again? I said, well, what is that? She said, can you come back and do his job? And I had did, I wrote, I wrote his job 22 years ago. LaQuinta was two years old when I wrote it for the very first time we recorded in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and uh, she was barely walking and my aunt Carolyn led it. And then I came back again years later, and then the late Antonio Clark and New Mercy X, could they do it? And I didn't lead it. I wrote the song for aunt Carolyn and uh, she was unable to sing because she was having hip surgery. And she wouldn't be prepared to sing. So I told Tony, I said, Tony, I says, I, we got to find somebody to sing it in New Mercy. I'll teach it. You know, we've taught the song. He says, you sing it. I'm like, no, 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 no. I said, you, you're not understanding. I didn't write this for me. I, I wrote this for somebody else. I said, so I was thinking he was going to say, well, give it to my goddaughter, Darla, Darla Spinner, who sung with him, was singing with him now. And so he says, no, you sing it. And he says, choir stand. He said, LaQuint's coming at this time. We're gonna do, and, and they started the music and I had to sing it. And so I tested. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And that night we did it and it got over very well. And so LaQuinta fell in love with that song. And so she said, would you do it again? And uh, she said, some special. And it must have been something special because the arrangement that we did on it now, this go round, um, the things that the Lord was telling me in this song, it happened like 12 o'clock midnight. I never will forget. I was talking to another one of my spiritual God sons. He sings with me, Tony. And Tony said, a trance came over me because we were FaceTiming one another. And mm -hmm. he was talking about how good the song was. And I hadn't had it. I couldn't get the vamp, but I know I didn't want it to stay the same. I wanted something different. And it was like, we was in conversation and he says, a trance came over me. And he said, and before he knew it, he says, dad, I said, what? I said, listen, let me, I got to get away. Let me, I, let me call you back. I'll call you back. And Carl, I went and I had my little black book and I started writing, you know, and he gave me the words to step back, move aside, let him do his job. It's his job. It's not mine. Let him do his job. And so I said, you talking to me. That's what God was doing. He was talking to me. Mm -hmm. I was disobedient for those years that he said, I said, move out the way. I asked you to come from among this for a minute. I want to talk to you. And this is why you had so much turmoil going on because yeah. you didn't come and I asked you to do. I want you to let me do my job. You're worrying about trying to fix something that I've got in control. That's my job. That's not yours. They're not singing about you. Your name is not in any of these songs that we're singing about. My name is. Hmm. Step back, move aside. You know, I got power, I got healing, deliverance, joy, salvation. It's all in my job. I can fix it, but you can't. You're trying to do my job. Move out the way. And that's how I came up with the new one, the new rendition for his job. Man, it, it's an awesome song. It's a great song. The energy of the song is great. Uh, one last thing about the song. You talked about Antonio Clark. Uh, you also talk in the song about uh, Kevin Lemons. And someone that was dear to all of us, Carol Cole. Why was it important for you to speak those names in the song? 
and also featured them on the cover. It was important to me that I did that because all three of them were like my family. Mm -hmm. I worked with Carol for I don't know how many years, you know, because, you know, Carol and I went to high school together and then we sung in the voices, we sang the voices together. And then me and Carol had a longevity, a long, longevity. Carol played the organ for, uh, for Palestine for 18 years and I directed there for 19 years. I got her at, um, at Palestine through my, um, uh, my uh, play uncle Eugene who was playing there and we needed an organist. So we got her. And um, the calls that we would have, the, 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 the communication, it was not like, oh, she's my friend and I know her pretty good. I mean, Carol would, we would talk, you know, talk. Quint, don't get upset, you know, what have you. Uh, when LaQuinta was expecting, I was, she said, well, what you, what you can't, how, it's that happened, LaQuinta, what you gonna do? You gonna kill yourself, you know? And that's the way Carol would talk to me. And uh, you gotta let God do what he's gotta do. And you can't do that. They grown now, LaQuinta. I'm like, yeah, Carol. And that was important to me. And then Antonio Clark was important to me because he gave me the privilege, I want you to help me with New Mercy and this, that, and the other. We became close and I helped with vocals and and, and uh, tightening up things and diction and what have you. And that was it. And then Kevin, I mean, Kevin was like my little brother. You know, I was the first one to ever bring Kevin Lemons here to the city of Detroit to sing. He and Zach Williams uh, from One Accord out of Philadelphia. And we became tight, you know, I mean, so tight that Kevin actually thought when I got sick and had a, had a surgery one time, he called up and he didn't call like, were you okay? I'm gonna be praying for you. No, he was, he was at me, you know, why did you do that? Why don't you be still? I'm coming up there. No, don't come up here. I don't want you up here. I'm coming anyway, you know, and that's the way it was between him and Zach and I, you know, I was the oldest, but Kevin thought that he was the ruler. That's the way Kevin Lemons was. I'm the ruler. I mean, you and Zach, I, you just hush and I'm doing this. I'm the, you know, and that's the way it is. Kevin had a thing like if I kissed the baby, he would tell me, call me up on the phone. I see you on Facebook. Don't kiss my baby no more. <laughs> I'm like, what you say? Don't kiss my baby no more. I'm, don't kiss my baby no more. This is not your baby. This is LaQuinta's baby. I said, don't kiss my baby. I'll see y'all when I get there in September. Don't kiss my baby no more. And to have Kevin to come here um, the 3rd of September and we see each other and he'd be my guest for our anniversary. Didn't know. That was it. Wow. And then the Monday that before he passed that Saturday, I knew that Antonio Clark was sick and they had turned him over to hospice. Nobody knew it. So I'm helping my godson, Ramon, and trying to keep it calm because they didn't want it out so quickly. So Kevin asked me, how was he doing? And I told him, I said, just pray deeply. I said, you need to pray deeply. And then I get to Saturday. And then I get to call Kevin dead. He gone. Wow. Kevin who? Kevin just talked to me to get Larry Callahan's telephone number to appear on the program. Kevin, who are you talking? And I and the only reason why I knew it was concrete because uh, Tanisha was Kevin's assistant, one of them. And I knew it was real. Wow. And she had Staffy on the phone. And I just, I lost it. And so I got it together. So I'm going to the service. So they made me come on in. Uh, 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 T, the, well, I call uh, Tiana T. So T said, big bro, you got to come. I said, I don't know if I can do this. but And, and so we're gonna, we're gonna, we, we got you. You, you got to be here. So I, I, may, I went on to the funeral. But the Wednesday before I got ready to go, then Tony makes his transition. So Tony is gone. So I'm leaving Kevin's funeral to come back home to help with New Mercy they prepared for Tony's home going. And then here comes Carol. 
I'm like, God, what is this? What, what are you saying to me? These, these are people that's important to me. What is this? You know, what is this? What is this? And all three of them love to hear me sing, just let God do his job. Wow. So I say, that's what I'm going to do. I, I, I won't forget y'all, you know. So I put it in memory of them. And I didn't want it to be on the back. I wanted to be up front. I needed their spirit to be up front with me. Wow. And I did. McQuint, this interview has been awesome to hear the history, to hear how God has, how you've learned to step aside and let God do his job. Yeah. How can people get your music? How can they follow you? How can they contact you? And how can I hear you on a, on another network? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always hear me on uh, 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 on Brother Carl Phillips. Um, is that Prove Me Radio Station? Prove Me Gospel it's, Radio. <laughs> Prove Me Gospel Radio. It's over here. You know, just call him and tell him I want to hear it. I need that. Okay, but it is it it is on every every social media outlet that you can find it at where you shop and get music it's available there and it's being distributed by uh distro kid so uh you can get it there if you need to contact dr eloquent weaver you can always hit me up in my inbox on facebook i have three pages dr eloquent weaver the second laquent weaver and then eloquent weaver okay or and go and hit me up in we praise radio or you can just call me at 313-704-5974, okay? And I'm there, you know, or, uh, anytime that you need us to come and be a blessing to you. And we love ministering. So, hey, just give us a call. So uh, that that's it. It's everywhere. Again, my that we're, we're not a lot of months apart in age, but he's still my big brother. You know, <laughs> you know I thought you was the, I know this. You're older because you're like April, something like that. April, I'm May. You're May. I'm September. So you, you're you a few months older than me, but so I, I'll call you my big brother. Okay. Okay, Lavelle Nero. That's what he does to me. <laughs> Let's try to get. Again, thank you for stopping by the Carl B. Phillips Show. Give it up for my guest, Dr. Eloquent Weaver. As a reminder, remember to work like you don't need the money, love like you've never been hurt, and dance like no one's watching you. God bless until we have the opportunity to meet again. Take care. Uh. The Carl B. Phillips Show. Thank you for listening to the Carl B. Phillips Show. For more information, go to carlbphillips.com. The Carl B. Phillips Show. Follow Carl B. Phillips on Instagram so we can stay in contact with each other.